You're listening to Life, the Universe, and Everything Else. Today on the show, people who are right. <laughs> <laughs> Life, the universe, and everything else explores the intersection of science and society. Original music is produced by Ian James, and this episode was edited by Marissa McCool. Find her on Patreon at patreon.com slash QAF. Today on the show, I'm hosting, talking about people who are right. You know what I was not right about? I didn't introduce my co-hosts before I started into my introduction that I did not really plan very well. <laughs> <laughs> but they'll be joining me. People like Laura Creek Newman. Hi there. Jem Newman. Hello. And Lauren Bailey. Hi, who are you? My name is Ashlyn Noble. I'll be telling you about people who are right. Well, one person who is right. <laughs> We've talked about people who are right on this podcast before. The one that comes to mind most easily is Semmelweis. <laughs> Laura was talking about that today. She was saying, you're not talking about Semmelweis again, are you? You just can't shut up about that guy. <laughs> I said it a little bit more politely than that. <laughs> Did you? Truly, I did. I just said, I feel like we've talked about him enough. <laughs> he was the guy who said that maybe you should wash your hands in between an autopsy and a childbirth. For those of you who may not have extensively researched our back catalog. <laughs> Welcome new listeners after our three hour <laughs> odyssey last month. Yeah, <laughs> That was a good time though, everybody, right? I think we had a good time. We did. I'm going to start us out today with a guy that I learned about earlier today. <laughs> I was looking through lists and Reddit posts of just people who weren't believed and most of them I had heard about and some of them was, sounded very interesting but I just wasn't that, didn't capture me today, didn't make me want to research their story and present it to you. But this guy, this guy I was fascinated by and as I said to my co-host earlier, I think that I read every non-redundant piece of information on the internet about this man. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. David Steves was a 24-year-old Air Force pilot who was piloting a T-33 training jet in May of 1957 when he disappeared. He was reportedly handsome, smoked a pipe, and drove a Corvette. The real Tom Cruise of his day, they said. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, he was a test pilot who was apparently quite pretty, and he disappeared. He took off from an Air Force base near San Francisco and headed east, but never made it to his destination. The Air Force declared him dead after a brief search, wherein they unsurprisingly found no wreckage in the vast Sierra Nevada mountains. To everyone's surprise and delight, however, Steves reappeared after 54 days, injured and malnourished. He explained that something had gone explosively wrong with his jet and he was forced to eject. He said that he landed badly in the Doozy Basin of the Kings Canyon National Park at what he estimated to be about 12,000 feet, injuring both ankles. For two weeks, he crawled and slid 20 miles in freezing conditions with no food, using his parachute for his only warmth and shelter. Today, this is part of the very well-known John Muir Trail in California and is rated as challenging on a popular hiking site. <laughs> <laughs> with modern hiking equipment. At 20 miles with two possibly broken ankles, <laughs> slipping and sliding through mud. Not and a, a good parachute. Time. With a parachute, yeah. Wow. On day 15, he happened upon an abandoned ranger's cabin that contained a few cans of food, a fly fishing kit, and a canned ham. <laughs> that had to have been the best ham ever. <laughs> yes. Lucky ham guy. is lifesaver. Oh. He was able to catch some fish and used a salt lick to trap a deer. Once he had somewhat recovered, he tried to cross a river to get closer to civilization. He had, I guess, found some records in the, in the cabin that let him orient himself a bit. But it was a bad time of year, and the river was high and fast due to meltwater, and he nearly drowned and lost some of what little he'd brought from the cabin. Oh. 
luckily for him, he found or was found, I'm not clear, by a group traveling by horseback near Granite Basin and was brought back to town where he was greeted as a hero. A couple of days after he reappeared, he told reporters that his ankles were still swollen, but he was doing okay. <laughs> like, that is remarkable for 54 days. Oh, gosh, wow. yeah. He was reunited with his wife and children. There was a book deal inked and a movie in the works when questions began to arise. Wait, one second. How old was he? 24, you said? He was 24. Wife and children? With, this was 1957. Yeah. I know. I know people only live to, like... 43. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had, I think, two young children at this time. Yeah, I mean, like, and he's what, military. Yeah. yeah. So, so he joined at 18, young. married 20. He could have and a two year old and a four year old. Like, he yeah. for sure enlisted at 18. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, questions. They began to arise. <laughs> like the one I asked. <laughs> <laughs> No one could find the wreckage of the T-33 chaining jet that David Steves had been piloting. Suspicions were high due to the Cold War, and there was some suggestion that he had given the jet to Russia, or had somehow shipped it piece by piece to Mexico. What? <laughs> Later that summer, a reporter went with David to see if he could find the plane, but the melted snow had obscured his trail and they failed to find anything. Dun, dun, dun. The worst part, in my opinion, of this whole story is that no one ever seriously thought that this theory was very good. The jet in question was 10 years old already at the time that it disappeared. It had no particularly interesting technology. There was nothing that the Russians would have not known about. And it would be obsolete, this particular jet, in another 10 years anyway. So if he's a he was a test pilot? Mm -hmm. So why was he flying like an old jet? Is that a common practice? All that I could find out was he was simply ordered to take this jet from one air base to another. I think uh, it was simply like, we need to get this transfer. plane yeah, yeah. somewhere mm -hmm. else. Okay, yeah. Nobody thought this theory was good. It was a crappy old plane. Why would the Russians want it anyway? They found evidence in the form of his parachute that was still out there on the slopes and the records in the Rangers' cabin that I had mentioned that he used to orient himself. So, like, there was evidence that his story was true, even though they couldn't find the plane. Despite this, the official Air Force report listed hoax as one of three possible explanations for the missing jet. Yikes. Public sentiment turned against him, and he lost the book deal, the movie deal, the magazine series, his wife, and his children with her. Although no charges were the, ever... The military took away his wife? Or... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they just, I don't know, thought that he was a liar, and so they didn't want to be associated with some commie pinko that sold a jet to Russia. A scandalo. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big yikes. And no charges were ever laid against him, although he requested and was granted a discharge from the Air Force. So he didn't have to keep working for these people who <laughs> thought that maybe they lied to him, he lied to them. Over the subsequent years, Steve's move to Fresno and got jobs as a pilot as well as designing and flying experimental aircraft. He was known to often fly over the area of the mountains where he had crashed, looking for any sign of the missing jet, but he was never successful. Hikers familiar with the area said that even on the ground, the mountains are so rugged that it could be five feet from you and you would never know. Yikes. Tragically, David Steves died in 1965 in a plane crash while testing an aircraft that he had helped design. Over 10 years later, Boy Scouts found an aircraft canopy hiking in the Doozy Basin in the National Park and reported it to rangers. The serial number matched the missing T-33 jet right where David Steves said he landed. The rest of the plane has not been found to date. When you said that the Air Force took his wife or whatever, <laughs> here's the biggest bummer that I did not put in here, but now I feel like I have to. The, the comment from his widow after they found the plane was, oh good, now... His children can have good memories of him. Whoa. Right? Like, wow, you must have poisoned those children against him for no reason to say something like that. <laughs> good Goodness Lord. gracious. That's some parental so, alienation right there. Yeah. yeah. And ten years yeah. after he died, they finally found the plane that he said was there all along. He was right, and he survived a horrifying experience, and people did not believe him. Like, these days we make the movie first and then look for the evidence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sound of freedom, anyone? Yeah. Ooh. It just makes me think about how American everything... American Sniper, American <laughs> Sniper, all of those. Sorry. Even if everyone admits this story makes no sense and we have evidence that says, that agrees with you, if you are like, but maybe people will run with that <laughs> yeah and that sucks 
It's funny. It's funny. Like people, he gives a very plausible story. And people are like, well, but what if it's a hoax? And everybody just like flips to hoax. But you see some shot of blurry lights in the distance in the sky. And everybody's mm -hmm. like, aliens. And you're like, well, but what if hoax? And they're like, nah, it's aliens. <laughs> well, both of these things contain something that is unexplained and cannot be engaged with tactilely. Like, there is no plane. Mm -hmm. So when there is no plane... That fuels the hoax and all of that confirmation. But there's no plane, mm -hmm. right? Because the parachute's with him. The plane is separate, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that same, like, it, and with the aliens, like, blips in the sky, there isn't a thing right here that we can, like, touch and figure it out. So we can do that. Yeah. And it sucks. But people are like, well, where's the plane? And it's, like, shattered in a million pieces, scattered across, like, terribly rugged mountains where you're definitely not going to find it. Mm. And there's no one to blame for mm. UFOs. He was an easy person to blame, especially in the whole McCarthy era. Yeah. And everybody doing the Red Scare thing. Yeah, absolutely. When that was, like, your unexplained ghosts, mm -hmm. right? It's the, it's the Russians. It's clearly the Russians. Well, yeah. then everything's the Russians when you're looking for the Russians. It's funny that you said he came up with a very plausible story because one of the quotes that apparently did not help from him was, people can believe or disbelieve it as they choose. If the story is so miraculous they don't believe it, then it is just that much better of a story. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Now we're going to move on to someone who was right about Catholics. Oh boy. <laughs> Sinead O'Connor was never a pop star. Was Sinead a rebellion? Shock me, shock me, shock me with that deviant behavior. She always considered herself a protest singer. In 1992, following her smash, and in several including my opinions, best version of Nothing Compares to You, on her second album, she appeared on Saturday Night Live, which was hosted by Tim Robbins. O'Connor had been scheduled to appear on an SNL episode in 1990, but refused when she found out that the host was going to be noted misogynist and dirtbag Andrew Dice Clay. So the 1992 gig was her first appearance on the show. For her second set, she performed an a cappella version of Bob Marley's War, with new lyrics related to child abuse. At the end of the song, she said, Fight the real enemy! and ripped up a picture of then-Pope John Paul II and threw the pieces on the floor. People, right on. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was babysitting that night, and I remember watching, and it was really... <laughs> it was fascinating. People lost their minds. O'Connor was banned for life from SNL. Some folks hired a steamroller to destroy her records in a protest outside her record label's office. The Catholic Anti-Defamation League condemned her. Celebrities like Joe Pesci and Frank Sinatra and Madonna ridiculed her. They all found their Catholicism in them. Crowds booed her, even at the Bob Dylan tribute she did later that year. But, as we all know now, Sinead O'Connor was right. <laughs> she said in subsequent interviews that she held the Catholic Church responsible for the physical, sexual, and emotional abuse that she had suffered as a child. She said the Church had destroyed, quote, entire races of people, and that Catholic priests had been abusing children for years. Her protest took place nine years before John Paul II publicly acknowledged child sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, ending decades of cover-ups. Well, hopefully ending yeah, some I, of the I don't know whether yeah. ending is necessarily... Yeah. yeah. No longer objecting to the truth. <laughs> well... <laughs> I tried, I tried. Yeah, I wrote this when I was feeling a lot less cynical this afternoon. <laughs> you did more than he did. Yes. <laughs> From 2001 to 2010, the Vatican examined decades of sex abuse cases and cover-ups involving over 3,000 priests. Members of the Church's hierarchy have argued that media coverage was excessive and disproportionate, and that such abuse also takes place in other religions and institutions. Well, no shit, but we're looking at you right now. <laughs> it does not diminish the Catholic Church's role in their abuse of so many children. Greater or similar wrongs don't make the actions right. Hmm. In January 1995, O'Connor appeared on the British late television program called After Dark on an episode titled Ireland, Sex and Celibacy, Church and State. 
you know, light topics. <laughs> <laughs> she linked abuse in families to the Catholic Church. The discussion included a Dominican friar and another representative of the Roman Catholic Church, along with the former Irish Prime Minister Garrett Fitzgerald. The host described the event as, quote, Sinead came on and argued that abuse in families was coded in by the church because it refused to accept the accounts of women and children. And she was right. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding! What do we have for her, Johnny? O'Connor repeatedly said that she did not regret her act. In her 2021 memoir, Rememberings, she wrote that the incident had put her, quote, back on the right track following a personal crisis based on the success of Nothing Compares to You. In the 20 years following John Paul II's 2001 apology, the Catholic Church has attempted to make amends, but keeps putting its slippered feet directly in its mouth. More and higher ranked officials have been proved to either abuse children or to cover up for known abusers in their ranks. So here's some numbers. According to a 2004 research study by the John Jay College of Criminal Justice for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, 4,392 Catholic priests and deacons in active ministry between 1950 and 2002 have been plausibly, which is they've neither been withdrawn or disproven, accused of underage sexual abuse by 10,667 individuals, estimating the number of priests and deacons active in the same period at 110,000, the report concluded that approximately 4% have faced these allegations. Jeez. The report noted that, quote, it is impossible to determine from our surveys what percent of all actual cases of abuse that occurred between 1950 and 2002 have been reported to the church and are therefore in our data set. So this is the known numbers. Yeah. Right. And Actual numbers likely yeah. higher. 4% is, as they say, equivalent to the non-church population as well. Mm. But that doesn't make it any better. That's, mm -hmm. that's high. That's, oh. Yeah. I don't like how high that is for a non-church population either. Yeah. I... Mm -hmm. And this is reported and non taken back. So the real number is really high. Mm -hmm. Official nationwide inquiries into Catholic Church abuse of children have only been officially conducted in the United States and in, in O'Connor's country of Ireland. In Ireland, the Commission to Inquire into Child Abuse, also known as the Lafoy and then as the Ryan Commission, we've probably heard of the Ryan Commission, the Ryan Report, they issued the 2009 Ryan Report, that covered six decades, from the 1950s, though the commission was empowered to look at abuse from the 1930s on, but they only published on the 1950s onwards. It noted endemic sexual abuse in Catholic boys' institutions, saying that church leaders were aware of abuses and that government inspectors failed to, quote, stop beatings, rapes, and humiliation. The report noted that centrality of poverty and social vulnerability in the lives of the victims of abuse. So they preyed on those who wouldn't be believed. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. The Ryan Report didn't include abuses at other Catholic-run institutions, including the Magdalene Laundries and similar group homes slash forced labor organizations. And O'Connor had said she had been abused in a Magdalene Laundry in her childhood and teenage years. After the abuses hidden by the Catholic Church became public, opinion towards O'Connor had changed. New York Times journalist Amanda Hess wrote in 2021 that Quote, few cultural castaways have been more vindicated by the passage of time, adding mm -hmm. that the backlash O'Connor experienced was, quote, about the kind of provocations we accept from women in music. Uh huh. O'Connor continued to be an outspoken voice for causes both in Ireland and internationally for the rest of her life, but was more likely in the news for issues slash choices in her personal life that became public. She was ordained a priest in 1999 by the Independent Catholic Church and continued in her Christian faith for decades. Upon the 2014 election of Pope Francis, she said, quote, Well, you know, I guess everyone the best, and I don't know anything about the man, so I'm not going to rush to judge him on one thing or another, but I would say he has a scientifically impossible task, because all religions, but certainly the Catholic Church, is really a house built on sand, and it's drowning in a sea of conditional love, and therefore it can't survive. And actually, the office of the Pope itself is an anti-Christian office, the idea that Christ needs a representative is laughable and blasphemous at the same time. Therefore, it is a house built on sand, and we need to rescue God from religion, 
all religions. They've become a smokescreen that distracts people from the fact that there is a Holy Spirit, and when you study the Gospels, you see the Christ character come to tell us that we only need to talk directly to God, and we never needed religion. In 2014, she refused to... Another thing she was right about... She refused to play in Israel as an act of protest against the state's treatment of Palestinians, stating that, let's just say that, on a human level, nobody with any sanity, including myself, would have anything but sympathy for the Palestinian plight. <laughs> right on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In October 2018, O'Connor converted to Islam, calling it the natural conclusion of any intelligent theologian's journey. <laughs> wow. Okay. And maybe some things she was less right about. Yeah, I'm not, I'm <laughs> not sure I'd go that far. But sure. There was, we're just going to look at, at the progression. Sure. <laughs> Ceremony was conducted in Ireland by a Sunni Islamic theologian, and she also changed her name to Shahuda Davit. In a message on Twitter, she thanked her fellow Muslims for their support and uploaded a video of herself reciting the Adhan, the Islamic call to prayer. She also posted photos of herself wearing a hijab. She later changed her surname from Davit to Sadaqat, though continuing to publicly use the name Sinead O'Connor, which is why I'm using it in this. <laughs> so after years of mental illness and fibromyalgia and the self-inflicted death of her son in 2022, O'Connor admitted herself into a hospital. She appeared to be working on her recovery, but died of natural causes in July 2023 at the age of 56. On February 4, 2024, Annie Lennox played tribute to O'Connor by performing Nothing Compares to You during the In Memoriam segment at the Grammy Awards. Lennox ended the performance by calling for a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war and for peace in the world, which was also seen as a tribute to O'Connor's political outspokenness. Hmm. She was right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought when Ashwin first proposed this, seg this segment, Sinead O'Connor was the first person I thought of. I'm like, I could go back and do like a heretic... We could go back and look at my Michael Servetus again, because I didn't do him justice last time, but mm. I figure Sinead O'Connor needed her flowers. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I don't even know what you're doing. Well, let me tell you. All right. It's Jim's <laughs> turn to tell us what he's doing. I have been told I must keep this brief, so I'll <laughs> give him a best shot. Stanley Prusiner is an American neurologist. He got his MD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and he did his internship and then his residency in neurology at UC San Francisco. Dr. Prusiner's work is focused on neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. And for the last 25 years, he's been the director of the Institute for Neurodegenerative Diseases at University of California, San Francisco. However, he is best known for the discovery of prions, Ooh. or 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 prions. <laughs> However, you say it, yeah, prions. So, two things. First of all, what is a prion? And second, arguably more important, how is it pronounced? <laughs> a, prion, a prion is the tastiest part of the human body. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> So I imagine everyone on the panel remembers mad cow disease. I'm sure most of our listeners who are millennials, Gen Xers, and older will remember it too. But for any Zoomers, I don't think we have any Gen Alphas in the audience. Anybody under 14? What do they call uh, those? Alphies? Our 14-year-old has listened to it. Oh, okay. But so Crow considers itself... Gen Z. That's not true. Alpha. The Gen Alphas are babies, apparently. Oh, I yeah. see. Well, anyone those, born those after the, 2010, those are I think. the pre tweens that are buying up Sephora. So, uh, <laughs> Alfies, I think, I think they'll be called. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so for any Zoomers or Alfies in the audience, mad cow disease, or more properly, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE, is a fatal neurological infection in cattle. <laughs> Affected cattle begin losing weight, develop trouble walking, and display unusual behavior. There were a series of outbreaks of the disease in the United Kingdom in the 80s and 90s that was eventually traced to the use of meat and bone meal in cattle feed. Mm. BSE was able to make the jump to humans who consumed contaminated meat, causing what is now known as variant creutzfeldt jakob disease. For this reason... Until restrictions were lifted just this past December, anyone who had spent a significant amount of time in the United Kingdom was ineligible to donate blood in Canada. Oh, mm -hmm. I didn't know they'd lifted that. Yeah, yeah, they did. I just heard that Thursday on the mm. radio. 
In the early 1980s, the cause of BSE and similar encephalopathies was still unclear. These encephalopathies were clearly infectious in many cases, but scientists were unable to identify any viral, bacterial, or fungal pathogens that might be causing them. The spongiform encephalopathies also presented similarly to certain neurological diseases that were known to be heritable. At the time, Stanley Prusner was studying scrapie, a spongiform encephalopathy that affects goats and sheep. And he thought that he'd figured out the cause, but it was going to be a hard sell to the scientific community. What was this idea? Well, it was the prion, of course. But again, what is a prion? And more importantly, how is it pronounced? So to answer both of those questions, (laughs) I'm going to quote a New York Times article about spongiform encephalopathy by Sandra Blakesley, headlined, Heretical Theory on Brain Diseases Gains New Ground, from the 8th of October, 1991. It was 1991 and they're calling it heretical? Yep. (laughs) Jesus Christ. It's New York Times. You know, they hadn't changed their style. Yeah, they hadn't changed their style guide since 1850s. (laughs) The mystery centers on a bizarre disease that is known as encephalopathy because it attacks the brain, and spongiform because it leaves the brains of its victims chock full of holes. Humans are afflicted by three forms of spongiform encephalopathy, animals by four. Recently, to their utter astonishment, scientists found that the disease could be both hereditary and infectious. That is, victims can get it from bad genes or by being infected from another person or animal. The mystery is what kind of pathogen or disease-causing organism could behave in such a pattern. One scientific theory, viewed as heretical in that it seems to challenge the role of nucleic acids as the exclusive carriers of genetic information, says the pathogen may be a deadly variety of a normal protein that has the ability to amplify itself in the brain. The hypothetical protein is called a prion, pronounced prion. Wrong. With apologies to Dr. Prusner, I'm probably going to continue calling these things prions, not prions, because that's literally the only way I've ever heard it pronounced. (laughs) So, why is this heretical? Well, prions behave in a way that scientists had never seen simple proteins behave before. While non-living infectious agents have been identified, viruses, for example, are generally classified as non-living, though it's not an exact science, every infectious particle that has ever been identified contains complex polymers called nucleic acids, either in the form of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, or RNA, ribonucleic acid. These nucleic acids carry the instructions necessary for a cell to create new proteins and to replicate the infectious agent itself. Prior to the discovery of prions, no other form of self-replicating particle like this had been identified, as far as I know. I'll quote from everyone's favorite journal, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or oh. PNAS. Yeah, that reminds me, I have to update my subscription. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, Prions are unprecedented infectious pathogens that cause a group of invariably fatal neurodegenerative diseases by an entirely novel mechanism. Prion diseases may present as genetic, infectious, or sporadic disorders, all of which involve modification of the prion protein. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy, scrapie of the sheep, and Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease of humans are among the most notable prion diseases. Prions are transmissible particles that are devoid of nucleic acid and seem to be composed exclusively of a modified protein. The normal cellular prion protein is converted into the modified prion protein through a post-translational process during which it acquires a high beta sheet content. So basically... A prion is a misfolded protein that is able to induce other similar proteins to misfold in the exact same way. It's kind of like the Borg, I guess, if the Borg were a protein. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. So this idea was heretical because it was a novel mechanism, and therefore an extraordinary claim. And as we know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The good news for Dr. Prusner is that he had just that evidence available. I'll quote from the abstract of Novel Protonaceous Infectious Particles Cause Scrapie, the 1982 paper that introduced the concept of the prion. Quote, 
Six lines of evidence, including sensitivity to proteases, demonstrate that this agent contains a protein that is required for infectivity. Although the scrapie agent is irreversibly inactivated by alkali, five procedures with more specificity for modifying nucleic acids failed to cause inactivation. The agent shows heterogeneity with respect to size, apparently a result of its hydrophobicity. The smallest form may have a molecular weight of 50,000 or less. Because the novel properties of the scrapie agent distinguish it from viruses, plasmids, and viroids, a new term, prion, is proposed to denote a small, proteinaceous, infectious particle which is resistant to inactivation by most procedures that modify nucleic acids. Now, I know what you're all thinking. We have to address the elephant in the room right off the bat, because I'm thinking the same thing. I assume that my fellow panelists and all of our listeners are currently seething over the fact that if we are abbreviating protenaceous infectious particle, it should clearly be proene or proine, not prion or prion. But let's all take a moment to take a deep breath, calm our bodies, and move on. Can you imagine if everybody was calling it all those proines again? <laughs> proines are scary. <laughs> I can only think of prawn now, and then it would just be prawn jokes. All I can think of is a prawn with like a spring for a tail. I like that. They're all folded wrong, so they're proing wrong. <laughs> yeah, proing. Proing, that's why proing, they're not proing, boings. Proing. They're proings. Yeah. <laughs> Go sideways. <laughs> and then they hit the wall. They make scrapey noises. <laughs> <laughs> you made this happen, Jeff. <laughs> We're taking I'm, a breath. <laughs> I'm glad you all find neurodegenerative diseases so funny. As somebody with, important. <laughs> as somebody with dementia running in both their family lines, I mean, I have no choice but to laugh at it. <laughs> anyway. Prusner turned out to be right, and for his work on identifying prions, or proines, as the cause... <laughs> proine? 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 <laughs> like I said, the pronunciation of this thing is important. <laughs> so for his work in identifying prions as the cause of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1997. While I'm focusing on Prusner's contributions here, it is worth remembering that science is fundamentally collaborative, and Prusner built on the work of prior researchers, including Carlton Gradsek, who won the Nobel Prize in 1976 for demonstrating that another spongiform encephalopathy, Kuru, could be transmitted to chimpanzees by a novel infectious agent that was as yet unidentified. Credit is also due to Tikva Alper and John Stanley Griffith, who originally developed the hypothesis that transmissible spongiform encephalopathies were caused by a proteinaceous infectious agent devoid of DNA or RNA back in the 1960s. So, lots of collaboration here. But Prusner tends to get the credit for the prion. Well, he named it. He did. So what do these diseases actually do? So all known prion diseases are encephalopathies, spongiform encephalopathies, although there are some related diseases that might not quite be classified that way. But generally speaking, we're talking about spongiform encephalopathies, so brain infections that turn your brain into things that look Swiss like sponges. Mm -hmm. No, that'd be caseiform. Oh. Edamiform? No, stop it, <laughs> all of you. Boing. <laughs> I, I mean, like the term caseating is a common term in medicine that means becoming cheese-like. Uh, I don't want to know that. Yeah, sorry. The bad news all Cursed around. info. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if ever you, you hear your doctor walking away and saying the word caseating, be worried. <laughs> I've now added another one. There's oops. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... So, so many times I've been, like, stitching up somebody's scalp, and I've, like, dropped the <laughs> the needle, and I'm like, oops. Oh, I mean, everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no one ever believes you. <laughs> no. So, 
Prion diseases tend to cause spongiform encephalopathies. So these are neurodegenerative diseases, which in humans tend to manifest with progressive memory problems, poor coordination, visual disturbances, and behavioral changes. And all known prion diseases are fatal. The treatment is palliative. The most well-known Prion disease is Kritzfeld Jakob disease. 85% of cases of Kritzfeld Jakob are spontaneous. So the protein spontaneously, there's a specific protein called the prion protein that is present in all people and it spontaneously misfolds in these cases, resulting in what's called sporadic CJD. Well, that's terrifying. That is way more than I thought. Yeah. The majority of the remaining cases are inherited, which is called familial CJD, Mm -hmm. close to 15%, and less than 1%, so quite rarely, CJD can be acquired, typically due to medical procedures such as transfusions. It can happen with retinal transplants. The retina is part of the brain. Mm -hmm. And it can also happen due to consumption of contaminated food, which brings us to Kuru. So Kuru is a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy that was common among the four people of Papua New Guinea due to the practice of funerary endocannibalism. So that is the the practice of consuming the body of community members as part of the funeral rites. This practice ceased in the 1960s, but Kuru has an incubation period of between 10 and up to 50 years, and the last known Kuru victim died about 20 years ago. Mm. Kuru is thought to have begun when a community member of the four people developed spontaneous kritzfeld jakob disease, which then infected members of the community as a result of consumption of the brain matter during funerary rites. So the brain was traditionally reserved for women and children who are also more likely to be infected. The most terrifying prion disease, though, in my Could opinion... Could I ask a question, actually? Mm-hmm. So if there had been no spontaneous CJD... Would it have been okay to continue to do that? Like, could it, would, so my understanding was that the eating of brains would probably result in CJD just because you were eating brain, not, yeah. Is that incorrect? That That is incorrect. Okay. 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 Yeah. It is one of the few mechanisms by which CJD can be transmitted, right. but it, it won't spontaneously start as a result of eating brains. It okay. is an infection. Like brain going in won't trigger that. It's It was the risk that whatever brain you're eating could be infected. Already developed. Okay. Yeah. So and you don't know. And, and they yeah. didn't know, right? Yeah. yeah. So. I thought it was entirely, course, yeah. same as you did. I thought it was entirely eat a brain, get CJD. Yeah. Or Kuru. Well, and, and like when when Mad Cow was going on, like that was like mm-hmm. kind of the messaging, right? Yeah. Like don't eat any of those organ meats and things like yeah. that. That's all bad stuff. Because we knew there was a link, but they didn't – the explanation of what happened was not clear. It was right. just a blanket, like don't do that. Well, and, and with the Mad Cow disease, what would happen is the – eating the meat of the animal, like the muscle meat, was much less likely to transmit the disease. But mm-hmm. if you ate the brain, you were – Pretty much, from my understanding, guaranteed to oh, be wow. infected. So, or, or whereas significantly, with Kuru, it sounds like it was not as likely. Well, with with the the thing is, it is unlikely. It is very unlikely for somebody to develop a spongiform encephalopathy, and it is very unlikely for like spontaneously. Even though the the majority of cases are spontaneous, it's right. still a very rare disease. Okay. Yeah. However. If that person, if somebody does get infected and they are in a culture that practices eating the brains of almost every person who dies, then you're kind of guaranteed then to get a massive outbreak right. with a huge yeah. spread. Once you are infected with it, can you pass it down or is that only if you have the inheritable version of no, it? No, you can pass it down. Okay. So it's, it basically functions the same way. Ooh. Oh. Yeah. So, so oh, that's okay. How did they stop the that... transmission in their community? Did they just have to have like, you they stopped, get to have they children? They stopped eating brains. Uh, so you, sorry. So you're, you're asking. Like is, if I is, eat it is, and I, and I it. get it and then I have a child, does my child automatically get it? No. Okay. Is so that what you were asking? get it? Yes. Unclear. Okay. But ba- basically, if you have the familial version, then that means you have a gene that makes a misfolded protein. Right. right. Mm-hmm. And so you, that misfolded protein will accumulate because you have a mutation in the gene. Yeah. Mm-hmm. However, 
if you have the infectious version, basically just you got that misfolded protein by like directly eating it, mm-hmm. and but it, it will proteins. induce other proteins yeah. to misfold. Yeah. So your body isn't creating it, but it essentially functions as though your body were. It's just as just yeah. as dangerous, which yep. is one of the one of the things that makes it interesting. And do they pass the placenta? I guess that's mostly what I'm asking. Right. That that's a good question, and I I don't know. They yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. And because it's such a rare disease, yeah, it's, hard it's really study. hard to study. And I would imagine at this point, too, that people who find out that they have the familial version might be more cautious about having children. I don't know. Or it, like they might be changing their, there yeah. might be changes in practices because of known. Well, so things. with the familial version, it tends to present later in life. Mm-hmm. A lot of these things, when you have the inherited version, it presents later, but it but it does vary. So I'll, mm-hmm. I'll actually okay. talk about the, the last prion disease that I want to talk about is called... Familial fatal insomnia. Which, oh, oh yes. I have already you told totally everybody did a about this. Segment about yeah. That. yeah, I remember that. The most terrifying disease ever. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So just a quick recap for our listeners, because we have <laughs> talked about it before, but because it's a prion disease, I, I had to mention it again. It's an extremely rare heritable prion disease that is related to CJD. Onset is typically around age 50, and it comes in four stages. Life expectancy is usually less than two years after onset. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the first stage, you you develop months of progressive insomnia, resulting in panic attacks, paranoia, and intense phobias. Then you get worsening panic attacks for a few months, accompanied by hallucinations. It eventually progresses to the complete inability to sleep, which is followed by rapid loss of weight. And then... People get dementia, progressing to complete unresponsiveness over a period of about six months, and then they die. And there is there is no treatment aside from comfort care. I'm surprised you didn't touch on the deer one. Yes, chronic wasting. Yeah, chronic wasting disease. That it is essentially identical to scrapie or Mm. BSE. It's Mm -hmm. just the deer version of it. Are are ruminants more likely to have this type of thing? Because we know of a lot of ruminant versions but i I don't hear of like pig scrapey but maybe pig scrapey exists i don't know chitlins Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's a good question and i really don't know the answer yeah okay no i'm just like i was wondering because these are all ruminants and i mean Mm -hmm. humans are known to spend a lot of time around ruminants and keep them and etc etc i was just curious if you're also looking at a ruminant with this this folded proteins then you might look for it in more like you might go searching for it in near populations. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I just randomly Googled pig scrapey to see what comes up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Did the internet not disappoint? <laughs> so, apparently, pigs can, like, if they eat an infectious agent, they can maybe transmit it, but they do not show clinical signs of the disease. <laughs> wow. That's <Wow>. wild. <laughs> That's terrifying. Thanks, Jem. That was horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. I'm glad that he was eventually believed. I definitely remember the beginning of the mm-hmm. panic and people saying like, oh, I don't know if we believe that these are a real thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I'm kind of team viruses are alive too, so I'm not sure. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they replicate themselves and they want to survive. They like, don't replicate. Else? Well, they don't rec- replicate themselves. Well, like, they need to hijack we. somebody we else to replicate We need other them. things to replicate, too. Yeah, that's, I don't know. that's true. I have a that's hard true. time with saying that they're not alive. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, we also need the right environment in order to yeah. re- replicate ourselves, right? Isn't isn't a virus just looking for a nice, cozy home with yeah. the right type it's of just, inputs? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't respire. They don't... <laughs> They don't like really speciesist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're all just out there looking for a good home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Come on, give a virus a break. Some of them eat bacteria, and we're gonna need those buddies <laughs> real soon. Oh boy, are we ever! series of bummers we have one more bummer and then we're going to talk about nice things but laura is going to tell us about a big bummer i am i'm going to tell you all about dr bennett amalu and football's concussion problem yay Yay. 
Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Omalu is a Nigerian-born American neuropathologist. In 2002, he performed an autopsy on former NFL player Mike Webster. He was known as Iron Mike for any mm-hmm. of those people who are sportsy. Not me. I learned this today. I know the name Iron Mike, but yeah. I could not have told He's, you. He was prolific in his time. I think as a linesman, I think. One of the guys who goes smashy, smashy, not throwy, throwy. Not the, the lineman for the county? No. <laughs> the only iron sportsman that I recognize is the Iron Sheik. <laughs> Long may he reign. Iron Mike, or Mike Webster, was 50 years old when he died. And he was known to have had significant neurological and psychological symptoms for years prior to his death. In fact, in the late 1990s, after a very long and unfair battle, the NFL finally provided him with a disability benefit, saying that he was permanently disabled because of his play in the NFL. Wow, they admitted it. They did. Oh my god! He admitted! Knowing this history of this football player, Dr. Omalu had a little bit of a hunch and asked special permission to preserve the brain for further study from a typical autopsy. Mike Webster had died of an apparent heart attack, and so typically a brain would not be thoroughly Mm -hmm. examined and dissected with that. During this more thorough examination, Dr. O'Malley noted abnormalities in his brain tissue consistent with evidence of past trauma. In 2005, Dr. O'Malley and co-authors published a case study of the study of Mike Webster's brain, describing the findings of the autopsy, and they used the term chronic traumatic encephalopathy for the first time in recent history. Specifically, the paper posits that the brain changes, which were specifically plaque buildups and tau protein tangles, could be caused by repeated head trauma, and that these were long-term consequences of repeated trauma. So let's talk a little bit about these tau tangles. I'm not going to get into it too much because I didn't look it up, and that's not (laughs) what this is about. But what you need to know is that tau proteins are a type of protein that tends to build up in the brain over time. It tends to happen where there was a bit of trauma or an infection or something like that. In healthy people that never get dementia, it will still build up, so you will see this. However, in diseases like Alzheimer's and other types of dementia, you will see lots of this. The existence of tau protein is part of human beings' Mm -hmm. life cycle. However, it's the tangles that get to be a problem here. It's when lots of this tau protein comes together and it forms a tangle and it starts messing with brain structure and function. And so the more of these you have and then where they cluster, that's going to cause the cognitive, the psychological, the mood effects, the memory, dementia, essentially. So that's what was different. When you have someone who is 50 years old, you don't expect to see these types of tangles, Hmm. especially the number of them. And especially important with this is that thinking of the person's family history. So in a family history where there isn't known dementia like Alzheimer's, you particularly don't expect to see large numbers of these early on in a person's life. The NFL noted great treatment of everyone in their employ had created something called the Minor Brain Injury Committee back in the 1990s to study, note my air quotes, the effects of concussion on their players. And in particular, or at the beginning, they were looking at it in regards to reviewing their return to play guidelines in (laughs) NFL games. In other words, if a guy gets knocked out on the field, can he go back in immediately Mm -hmm. as soon as he comes to? That's what they were asked to review. Yeah, this dude costs us money. When can we get him to... Or he's just not making us enough money yet. Yeah. Right? So we need to know a little bit about this committee here. The MBTI is what I'm going to call it. And remember that the first word is minor. Minor brain injury Hmm. committee. Traumatic brain injury committee. The chair of of, of this committee was also a team doctor, meaning that this person would be responsible for giving the go-ahead for return to play for their team. Many of the committee members were 
also team doctors. And the journal that they published in, I believe exclusively, which is the journal Neurosurgery, the editor-in-chief at the time was also a consultant for the New York Giants NFL team. Hmm. So no conflicts of interest at all. Never. Notably, no one on this committee was a neurologist. The head of the committee was a rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. A joint man. And for sp the brain. sports medicine. Yeah. Wait, so the journal's called Neurosurgery. They don't have any neurologists, which I guess is maybe... I mean, I, I would want a neurologist, especially if you're talking about CTE, but okay. But do they have any neurosurgeons? Hmm. No, because the NFL doesn't care. They took <laughs> anyone with an MD who works for them and threw them on this mm -hmm. committee. Okay. But I'm also thinking of, like, who's reviewing this article then? Who's reviewing this research? If it wasn't neuroscience. Never mind. Maybe I'm getting ahead of you. Not too much. No, mm, okay. not too much. There's a lot of there's a lot of conflict of interest and a mm -hmm. lot of not above the board stuff going on here. So this committee has a long history of publishing papers and statements refuting the link between concussion and ability to play and long-term brain health. Oh, great. Um, as well as attempting to discredit researchers whose papers support these connections. Classy bunch then. Very, very classy. So upon publishing of Omalu's paper, which was published in neurosurgery, purposely to try to get the attention of the NFL to say, hey, we found something you might be interested hmm. in. This committee immediately tried to get the paper retracted because they said that it was bad science, et cetera, et cetera. Fortunately, they were unsuccessful. In 2006, Omalu and colleagues published a second paper finding CTE, or I don't even remember what that stands for. <laughs> Chronic traumatic Thank encephalopathy. You. I'm like, words not working. Uh, finding CTE in another NFL player's brain. So the NFL really did not like Omalu for this and took every opportunity they could to downplay this connection. In 2007, the NFL held a concussion summit and specifically excluded Dr. Omalu from it. He was not That's invited. Not suspicious at all. No. Whereas people he worked with closely and co-authors were. Were they white? Hmm. There is a lot of this. Because remember, mm -hmm. he is a black, Nigerian-born, yep. young-ish doctor. He was pretty young at the time, too. He was graduated. He was a fully licensed. He was a neurosurgeon. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a neuropathologist. Okay. So he, so pathology, but he specialized or his, his area of interest was in the neurological mm -hmm. part of things. But he was relatively early in his career at so this point. A neuropathologist would be the neurosurgeon takes out the piece of brain and the yeah. neuropathologist looks at it under the mm -hmm. microscope. Yeah. And so so this is his jam, like looking at brains. This like this is his thing. Jam or Swiss cheese. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You're right to point that out because we can't overlook this here. There's a and and Dr. Omalu points out correctly that when you look at the structure of the NFL, the people doing the work and getting hit on the field are overwhelmingly black, African-American, not white. And the people who make the money and make the decisions are overwhelmingly white. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So it is whether or not it overtly caused problems, there is always these undertones of these kinds of things. And uh -huh. other people at mm -hmm. the time did recognize that as well. So again, luckily... Other researchers who had collaborated with Omalu, who were invited to the summit, brought the work and presented it nice. there. So the I work was that. presented there. Nobody yeah. is a dick like a scientific collaborator who's at uh, the other person on the paper is not being recognized. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. great. Pettiness is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Has its place. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so the NFL's response is to the football CTE connection that were brought up at the summit were either denied by some of their docs, like flat out during news conference saying there's no evidence, they didn't bring any, or they were reworked into the umbrella of, see, the NFL is working on this, and we have been for some time, and look, we're bringing this all in, and we're just not listening to them. Really trying to take ownership of it as though they were doing it. Mm -hmm. However, the CTE connection to repeated head trauma was not acknowledged. 
Over the years, Omala continued to examine former NFL players' brains and that the concussion committee continued to downplay the significance or deem his findings invalid. They, many observers at the time found that there was a pattern where anyone who wasn't a member of this NFL-based committee, their findings would be deemed invalid. They would find a reason for whatever reason <laughs> and do that. And this group really used tactics straight out of the tobacco industry playbook. It mm. was so obvious reading these accounts. So they would deny that being knocked out causes concussion or unfitness <laughs> to play. We don't know that that's true. It's literally so, like one of the criteria. <laughs> and and it's hilarious that it's their doctors who are saying this mm -hmm. and have quotations from them, saying that memory problems, cognitive symptoms, depression happen in all kinds of people, therefore can't be football related. <laughs> we just heard about the church talking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. No evidence that concussion has long-term effects, because we don't know that yet, except that somebody's telling you it might, but you're refusing to look at it. And this one's my favorite. They also claimed, potentially, that players in the NFL may be less prone to concussion or the potential damaging effects of concussion compared to regular people. Because these people had been... Um, let me let me explain this here. Because the people who were more inclined to get a concussion or have these damaging effects would have been selected out earlier in their football careers and stopped playing. So the oh. people who made it all the way up to the NFL must be impervious to these things. I thought they were going to go the opposite way. Like they were knocked around as children, so they got toughened up. <laughs> nope. Nope. They went with these guys' brains don't get concussed genetically. So... They can't. It can't be that. Okay, I'm just going to leave my face where it is right now and let Laura continue. <laughs> Those eyebrows are so high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just going to take a moment to quote from the National Library of Medicine right here. Most patients, greater than 90%, diagnosed with a concussion do not have an associated loss of consciousness. However, loss of consciousness is an important sign of a potentially serious head injury. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if they lose consciousness... That means it's worse, not better, than your standard concussion. Uh -huh. Like, if it's so bad that your brain goes, can't work, brain off now. Yeah. Reset. Like, that's really bad. Yeah, yeah you don't want your brain blue screening like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. When, when it's restarting, it's never a good sign. <laughs> so this last claim, not only does this make specious claims about the genetics of pro football players, but it completely ignores the potential damage done in lower level sports as well. Mm -hmm. They, it's just a completely mind blowing thing that they would come out and say this. It's one step away from eugenics when you see who they're talking about, sort of read between lines and it really, really is. Again, mm -hmm. let's remember the racial makeup of the different groups of people who make up the NFL. In 2012, the NFL finally disbanded the originally minor brain injury committee and instead partnered with the NIH to study concussions in football. However, in 2016, the NIH returned 16 million of the 30 million given to them by NFL for this research due to disagreements and concerns of interference in the research by the NFL. Hmm. So there are disputed claims on this, but when the NIH is like, you can keep the money, probably you're in the wrong. Mm -hmm. They, yeah. Throughout this time, Dr. Amalu continued his research and partnered with other universities. He never really ran a lab on his own. He wasn't an, an academic. He was a pathologist. And mm -hmm. he, I believe, still works as a, a coroner or in the coroner's yeah. office in, in places. That's been his primary employment. But he's worked with universities that do have labs and, and more specialists there. And during this same time period, additional labs studying CTE have sprung up across the United States under other researchers' guidance. So, so the research is ongoing. The NFL has been more cooperative with the other labs, but never with people connected to Omalu and, or Omalu himself. This is a story where the scientific community believed that something was happening, and it was the people who stood to potentially lose money and have to change their ways and admit they were wrong, that did a lot to get in the way. Now, 
I do want to acknowledge that Dr. O'Malley himself is not without controversy because rarely are there perfect heroes in this life. While he was the recent person to bring the term chronic traumatic encephalopathy to light, he has stated, I did not come up with this term. He decided to use it when he printed his first paper and subsequently. It was a little known term, though. It mostly existed in research circles, which for this type of research was relatively small for a long period of time. It has exploded in use and not in like, Worldwide right. use in the last 10 years. Exactly. And so, and his work, Dr. Amalu's work, is what popularized yeah. it. But did he invent this thing? No. And he does say, at least in some reports, that when he was examining that first brain, Mike Webster's brain, he was thinking of another syndrome, which was called dementia pugilistica, otherwise oh. known as punch drunk syndrome, yeah. which is known f- as early as 1928, or was documented as early as 1928 in boxers. Then it was thought of a boxing-specific condition, but it's the kind of thing that would happen when boxers would lose cognitive abilities Mm -hmm. relatively early in life after suffering knockouts and major head trauma, which we know boxing... Like, side note, why is boxing a sport? Like, what, what is boxing? <laughs> Punching each other in the face. Like, like, but that's the thing. If we take it out, like, this is not a sport. I don't get it. Boxing is not a sport. Boxing is a way to beat the shit out of somebody. Hey, there, anyway, are, there are body blows, too. Okay. It is the off oldest soap, sport. Off my soapbox, but it's just a thing that I've always been like, why is this a sport? <laughs> and in any case... Boys. I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. So, Dementia Pugilistica was the name. Dr. Omalu's accounts have said... I don't want to use that because it was seen as a boxing specific mm-hmm. sport. And this is not a boxer. We all know this is a famous NFLer. So let's use something a little bit different. Also, dementia pugilistica is kind of hard to say and doesn't like. It sounds like an Italian dish. It, it kind of does. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a brand new thing that nobody knew of, but it was something that was sort of relegated to the past, seen as, oh, well, a boxing thing. Mm-hmm. Important to note, too. At the time in the 40s where more research was being done on this, there were a lot of changes and a lot of calls to change the regulations around boxing and make it safer and reduce the head blows because of very famous cases. Very much like the kinds of things we've seen come out about NFL players and then also wrestlers, Mm -hmm. professional wrestlers in recent years today. So it's very much a cycle that's repeated itself. Also, interestingly, though, at the same time that these concussions, these these highly publicized concussions in boxing were happening back in the 40s. Lots of concussions were still happening in football and people weren't paying close attention. So football was getting off scot-free for a little while. As boxing dropped in popularity, a lot of that interest went over to football, which caused mm-hmm. even more issues. Yeah, but I mean, they put on new helmets, Laura. What do you want? Yeah, yeah. So that's another thing that we think about the invention of better helmets we think is leading to more concussions i'd believe it because as some of my research indicated when they were playing in the 30s and were wearing leather with a bit of padding over their ears they knew that if they crashed heads together you're gonna get messed up Mm -hmm. it's going to be bad news for everybody involved so they tried to avoid that then they put these giant domes on people's heads that wouldn't cause a scrape or a cut or a break Well, now we can put our heads down and drive at each other. It's feeling impervious. Well, exactly. You don't notice it. You don't recognize that your brain is still smacking around Mm. in there and those fibers are breaking and those that damage is happening over and over. By some estimates, offensive linemen are getting the equivalent of 20 to 30 Gs with every impact, which is absolutely absurd. Mm -hmm. So like every game they're getting ridiculous amounts of of force put on their heads and if you look at how they start and how they smash into each other it's head first Mm -hmm. it's head first at present so that was a side note but i think it's important to notice and so some of the controversy that people bring up there was a 2020 piece in the washington post that was talking about the dark side of dr amalu and i was reading through it to learn a little bit more and i'm just like jim do i trust the washington post he's like never no. and i'm like okay this is what i thought but i'm gonna read this anyway to see what it says mm-hmm. and so some people are saying that it's a smear piece by the nfl and 
et cetera, et cetera. I think these things are important to look at, that nobody is perfect and that everybody's accounts of things are going to be a little bit skewed, especially when there's so much on the line for both parties. Yeah. I did a segment on Sinead O'Connor. I think we're... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I just, I, I want to just be very clear that I'm not saying stuff like that. Other concerns are from other researchers are that Omalu's techniques or practices were somewhat questionable. However, again, there's like some known disagreements between labs. I really can't comment on this. At the end of the day, they all agree that CT is a thing and that it's highly linked to Mm -hmm. football players. Or people who dress up in medieval outfits and smack each other with damn sticks, David. Yeah, but they get... There's that's a far smaller number of people. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Harder to study, fewer brains. Well, that around. was a very pointed comment. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Another issue or or thing that people take issue with now is that presently Omalu tends to make a lot of his money by working as a paid speaker and expert witness discussing the risks of CTE and contact sports. And there are claims that he exaggerates the research and risks during these engagements and that he's profiting massively. If you Mm. So exaggerating the risks of people getting their getting hurt from right. head trauma is not. So uh, in some instances, he's being quoted as saying, like, people should never allow their kids to play football. They should never allow their kids to do this contact sport, do that contact sport, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of people make hyperbolic statements all the time, mm-hmm. all the oh, time. It made me think, like, is there a word for the term where. People aren't scared enough about the thing that you're trying to warn them about. So you build it up until it's scary enough that they believe it in proportion to how scary it is. Like, I know <laughs> that they kind of try to do that with hurricanes, right? Like, they try to get people to evacuate, even if they're the kind of people who typically don't. There must be a term for that. <laughs> I'm going to look into that. Chicken littling? <laughs> I, I don't know. But when you find it, share it. I definitely, for the record, I would not want our kids to play any form of, like, tackle sport whether you're talking rugby or football with, with tackling like what flag football touch football each other in the face no <laughs> <laughs> like even in the like face? hot dog like hot dog <laughs> i'm so tired hockey i tried i tried to say hockey and i said hot dog <laughs> like <laughs> hockey too it's like it's not safe okay yeah like, and the benefits don't seem to outweigh the risks no hello This is a producer's note from the producer of this show who is also a semi-professional women's football player. Fun little note. Our sport, our version of the sport, is not bereft of concussions. Of course not. Nothing is. However, it's interesting how much fewer there are in our sport, even at the highest levels. What I've noticed, most concussions from women's semi-pro football come from not tucking your head when you get knocked back or not protecting yourself, rather than head-on collisions or trying to beat the shit out of each other. I find that interesting. I wonder what the difference is. Have fun. Goodbye. Well, and it's how the sport is played, too. So Mm -hmm. part of it, in trying to make football safer, there have been times where people have suggested, well, if you change the starting position, if you move the lines certain distances, there'll be less force. If you just, yeah, have them stand up instead of crouch down. If you do these things, you're automatically going to reduce these things, but people don't want to do that. When we play in a very aggressive style, which is the way that our sports are played. Like, I think you can have a sport where you end up running into each other, but it's about the aggression behind it Mm -hmm. with things. And it's like, there's going to be sports where people get hurt. And that's, and the way that American style sports are played and exported brings that like aggressive, like hitting people is part of the game. It's like, that's a, no. There's a whole sociological, not even a paper. There's there's like a whole field Mm -hmm. about it. Absolutely. And I also want to just add back on the paid speaker and expert witness thing. I think these are greater issues with the way the medical and legal systems work in the United States as well that we should be taking issue with because expert witness is a controversial area that, again, I'm not prepared to talk about tonight, so I'm going to stop with that. Mm -hmm. But I want to say this is a symptom. This doesn't rest just on this one person. And I would also be interested to know how many of how many other medical professionals that 
the NFL might agree with might also work as expert witnesses sometimes. And it's how the system works. Get that money. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's that's exactly what this is here. So we are at the point where the scientific consensus is and has been for some time that CTE is a thing. It affects people who have repeated head trauma disproportionately. It causes dementia-like symptoms very early in life, including aggression and violence towards themselves and others. Yep. And that sports or professions that encourage lots of head contact and trauma see high rates of these kinds of things. So the scientific community is in agreement. Dr. O'Malley did not deserve what he got from the NFL and the NFL's bag of shit. Mm-hmm. Woo. I can say that, right? Well said. Oh, yeah. We don't have <laughs> lawyers, but yeah. Go ahead. I'll just have to start studying. Mm-hmm. No, you took the medicine. I will take the <laughs> I remember. Mm-hmm. Stop Wait, taking you, all the were jobs. Were you implying you're going to law school? That is definitely what he was implying. You! <laughs> <laughs> you almost got away with it, Jen. <laughs> if it wasn't for your meddling kids. <laughs> I got so, I, I got to learn something new now. <laughs> you can learn sitting your ass down. Learn how to be a real doctor. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, God. On that note, <laughs> those were many people who were right and got a lot of shit for it. So let's talk about something nice. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got one? I made really nice, fancy ramen out of stuff that I had in my house today, and I feel proud of it. And I made a really good soft-boiled egg that Dave said was perfect. Ooh, lovely. nice. The egg looked lovely. Nice, some, yeah. My something nice. <laughs> Excellent ramen. I don't usually make meals that are, like, just for our family anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I felt very guilty just asking for, like, buttered noodles with, with mushrooms, because that's just really what I wanted. And then Ashwin went above and beyond. Lovely. What's everyone else's? I recently finished a book called Piranesi by Susanna Clark. It was great. I really enjoyed it. It's kind of weird. It is kind of like if Borges wrote like a YA mystery novel, almost. Yeah. It's very fun. Susanna Clark is the author behind Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which I have not read. It is long, and I don't have time right now. But Piranesi is really great. It's a really interesting read, and it's nice and short. It's less than 300 pages. So yeah, I highly recommend it. It's on the top of my TBR, thanks to you earlier. <laughs> I've got one. Cause sure, go for it. It's actually Ashlyn let our little gay nerd Discord know about this earlier this week. It's HIV in cell culture can be completely eliminated using CRISPR gene editing technology. Hopes oh, cool. of a cure. Cool. Cool. Pretty cool. They've also done some research into can we deliver it to the cells where it is sort of holed up and mm-hmm. hiding? Mm. And they've kind of figured out how to search and destroy. Oh, really? The cells yeah. That have it. Oh, wow. It's eradicating it. It's, yeah. I was actually that's thinking while you were talking about prion diseases that like CRISPR probably has a lot of utility there in maybe the genes that are making those Mm -hmm. misfolded proteins to start with because I know that like once you once you have them they kind of in make each other do a thing yeah this feels like a CRISPR problem (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah it really does yeah just as you both were talking about the the medical things I'm like oh yeah here's a good medical thing (laughs) we found out this week it would be pretty cool if we could chop out the HIV DNA and get rid of it that'd be great oh Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. My something nice is that I I got to teach a couple of Kira's friends how to do Ukrainian Easter eggs oh, earlier yay. this week. They were they were interested and they were really up for it and did a great job and because it's not easy to do right on the oh, right yeah. on the get go and trying to explain to them that if you put the wax on now it'll stay that color but what if I want this color then we'll dye it and then we'll put the wax on mm-hmm. it was it's a real brain bender yeah. to to get used to but they did they did a good job and so I look forward to doing that again working in negative space is tough for oh. little brains it's, it's tough, tough for, for my brain, my brain. like <laughs> constantly. I'm like, wait, if I do yeah. this now, what is it? Uh, Dave's really gotten into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great. Is he? Has he done any this year? 
Yeah, we had some friends over a few weeks, weeks ago. ago. Yeah, oh, we nice. did a, yeah. a day where people could come over and decorate eggs, and it was great. Oh, lovely. Mm-hmm. That's fun. a fun day. Yeah. Nice. I think that's everybody. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you for joining me, everyone. That was a good episode of Things We Have Learned about mm-hmm. people who were right. <laughs> and it's less than half the length of our previous episode. It only took it took less than two hours to record. That is another something nice. You're, You're welcome, Marissa. Less than 90 minutes. Good night, everyone. Night. Good, good night. night. That's not fair. That's not fair at all. There was time now. There was was all the time I needed. Show notes and references for all of our episodes are available at lueepodcast.com, where you can also find links to donate or get in touch. If you'd like to support the show, the best way to do that is with a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you found us, or by sharing this episode with a friend. Life. Don't talk to me about life. Five procedures with more specificity for modifying nucleic acids. Acids. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are 12. Right. Nucleic acids. Okay. Try it again. <laughs>